This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel here in Crampton Auditorium. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. We're going to ask Ms. Deborah Ricks, a member of the Friends of the Chapel, to come at this time to light our unity candle. Thank you. And now, Ms. Natoy Fowler Rowe, a graduate assistant here in the office of the Dean of the Chapel, to come at this time to lead us through our worship experience. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. I would like to greet everyone here in person and our wonderful viewers online. Thank you to Crampton Auditorium, Spotlight, Holy Hands Interpreting Services, LLC, WHUT staff, and we have gentlemen of, gentlemen of Drew Social Club and ladies of the Quad Social Club helping with ushering today. We just wanna say thank you to all of you. We'd also like to acknowledge and thank our bell ringer, Carrington Boyer. Ms. Boyer is a senior's, senior honors inter, interdisciplinary excuse me, studies with a concentration in bioethics from Jacksonville, Florida, and a minor in biology. I forgot that part. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Christopher Bonner, a graduate assistant in the office of the Dean of the Chapel, will be reading our scripture. Following Reverend Bonner will be a selection from the liturgical dance ministry of Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel Beacon Liturgical Dance Ministry ministering to the song He Loves by Howard Gospel Choir. Good morning, Chapel family. This week's scripture is from Psalm 143, verse 8. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. And it reads, let me hear of your steadfast love in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Teach me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you again to Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel Beacon Liturgical Dance Ministry. At this time, I'd like to focus our attention on the bulletin. Offerings will be collected at the end of service. If you do not have a physical bulletin, you can also find them on our chapel website. There is also a QR code and link information provided on how to participate in giving digitally. If you are watching virtually, you may also contribute by visiting giving.howard.edu forward slash Rankin Chapel. We thank you in advance. We'd like to thank the speaker's assistant, Zion Eldridge, a sophomore political science major and African American studies minor. At this time, Ms. Dumani Rodriguez, the president of the Howard University Chapel Assistance, will join us for a warm welcome and to announce our calls to chapel. If you are giving a call to chapel, please join us to the left side of the stage. Thank you and enjoy the remainder of the service. Good morning, chapel family. I hope everyone had an amazing week and weekend. As always, the Office of the Dean of the Chapel welcomes you to join us for Meditation Mondays online with Dean Richardson and Wellness Wednesdays in the Little Chapel in Carnegie Building. More information regarding scheduling is listed in your bulletin, or you may speak to chapel assistants after service. May all CAs please rise. Thank you. The call to chapels today will be from the Friends of the Chapel, Gifting Knowledge Book Drive, Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University, Ladies of the Quad Social Club, and the National Council of Negro Women Howard University section. And y'all may come at this time. Good morning, Chapel family. My name is Bobby Caballero, and I serve as the chair for the Friends of the Chapel. I am Dr. Donna Grant Mills, and I serve as the chair of the Friends of the Chapel Student Support Committee. I love Black History Month. Can I get an amen? amen. I've been black my whole life. I'm black every day. But for Black History Month, I'm blickety, blickety black. I mean, I turn up. For Black History Month, the tradition that the Friends of the Chapel do is called Heritage Sunday, where we wear a tire that represents the African diaspora worldwide. So next, that'll be next Sunday. So if you want to wear something that represents your, um, the African diaspora, from wherever you are, um, that'll be next Sunday. Also, a lot of people have asked about these kenti stoles that the Friends of the Chapel wear to chapel. These stoles are a fundraising project for student support. These beautiful kenti stoles were designed by the Friends of the Chapel and handwoven in Ghana. If you would like more information about the fundraising project, kenti stoles for student support, please visit us in the vestibule following chapel service. Now, will all members of the Friends of the Chapel please stand to be recognized? Thank you, and have a blessed week. My name is Sierra Williamson, and I serve as this year's Community Service Chair for the Howard University Chapel Assistance. Today, I'm here to talk about our February Community Service Project, the Gifting Knowledge Book Drive, run by the Howard University Chapel Assistance, Kappa Delta Pi Honor Society and Education, Jewels Incorporated, and Pretty Brown Girls Howard University Chapel. The service initiative is focused on providing books to elementary and middle school age children throughout Washington, D.C as well as raising awareness about the importance of childhood literacy. According to DC Kids Count, only 14% of black students achieve third grade language and arts proficiency compared to 68% of their white peers. 
The Gifty Knowledge Book Drive exists to address this disparity through providing reading materials to our community partners. The drive will last until February 25th. We're looking for age-appropriate books for middle school and elementary school students. New and gently used books can be dropped off at Carnegie Hall in the yard during the week or purchased from our Amazon wish list at our LinkedIn bio. For more information, please visit our table in the lobby after service or follow us on the Chapel Assistance Instagram at CA underscore underscore Howard Drew. We appreciate our Howard community's continued support and look forward to don your donations this February. Thank you. Good morning, Chapel family. My name is William Jones, and I am a graduating senior, <laughs> business management major, classical voice minor from the Bronx, New York, and I am the president of the Howard Gospel Choir. Good morning. My name is Kristen Taylor, and I am the assistant business manager of the Howard Gospel Choir and an alumna graduated in 2007. Very soon, the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University will hit the road for our annual Spring Break Tour. Spring Break is an opportunity for students to return home or take a vacation from their collegiate studies. The members of the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University believe that they are called to steward their time differently. From March 1st to March 10th, we will embark on a multi-city tour to Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, Gary, Indiana, and Atlanta, Georgia, as ambassadors for Christ, this great music, our beloved university, the Mecca, and our families and our community. In each city, the choir schedule is packed with Sunday and Saturday morning worship experiences, full concerts, and media and educational appearances. We solicit your prayers and your support. To learn more about our schedule, visit howardgospelchoir.com. As we celebrate Black History Month, we wanted to also share our story. The first gospel group on campus of Howard University was the Celestials, which was started before the Howard Gospel Choir. This group includes Wesley Boyd, Danielle Hodge, Edward Sully, Richard Smallwood, Rosalind Tompkins Lynch, and others. And they were accompanied on occasion by V. Donnie Hathaway. As the story has been shared with me, two young women, Melanie Lee Russell and the late Rosalind Tompkins Lynch, returned to their dorm rooms one Sunday, and they had a dream that there was a group of students singing in front of the Fine Arts Building. After they had this dream, they both met each other in the hallway to discover that they both had the same dream. There was such unrest on this campus in the late 1960s after the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that there was a call for a revival on the campus. Reverend Harold Bell, a chaplain, called the Celestials to perform and asked that the students gather a choir to perform at the concert. When they gathered for the concert in the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel, after the choir ministered, the move of God was so powerful and unlike anything they'd experienced on this campus. After the concert, there were calls for this choir, this choir that had no name. It was called the Howard Gospel Choir. This choir gathered students, alumni, and members of the community of different denominations from all across the world to spread the good news. They were told by their fine arts professors to leave the choir because gospel music would ruin their voices. Their scholarships were threatened. Every choir on this campus, the Howard University Community Choir, the Law School Gospel Choir, the Divinity School Gospel Choir, are all birthed from the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University. We are all a part of this beautiful legacy of faith, of community. And when we talk to these originals, those that laid the foundation, they remind us that this choir was God's idea, and it was his business. Today and every day, we honor those that are with us and those that transitioned. Names like the late William Butch Brawner, 
names like the late co-founder, Pastor Rosalind Tompkins Lynch, the masterful Arphelius Paul Gatling, and of course, our sweet songbird, Teresa Watson. Today, over 50 years later, after traveling across this nation, over 20 countries visited, many schools, thousands of people met with the good news, we are still paving the way. Today, we stand as both the evidence and the carriers of this great legacy of gospel music on this campus. We look out and we think about this that we love, this piece of our culture. I hear stories of Mahalia Jackson singing for Dr. King and he would call her late at night and she would not sing for him the Star Spangled Banner, she would sing Precious Lord. And if we think about the March on Washington, we might have heard many songs, but we were hearing gospel music. And so I just challenge each one of us as we our social media world, we share and like and comment and leave emojis. We must be found on the right side of history, cultivating that which is important to us. We must be found celebrating that which belongs to us. Gospel music is ours. We don't have to look anywhere to figure out where the songs came from. They came from our churches. And we don't need to look to anybody for the passion because the passion came from deep down in our souls. We must be found cultivating this, our music. Yesterday, they were just trying to gather to sing and tell their professors that the music would be celebrated. But today, we are teaching the music wherever we go. Tomorrow, we will be building an endowment and looking for a recording studio and making sure that we have all the instruments so that every gospel choir on this campus will be able to go to a designated space. And I chuckled because recently, a fine arts professor told one of our students that they would never unlock the piano for the gospel choir. But I laughed. I said to myself, you must not know our history. Obviously, somebody's about to gift us a piano, and they will give us the key so that we could open it for every gospel choir on this campus. With all of the resilient, beautiful, powerful, soulful members of the Howard Gospel Choir and alumni, please stand in the building. God bless you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are y'all feeling on this Sunday? Okay, good to hear. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today on this beautiful Sunday. My name is Lauren Kirkpatrick. I'm a graduating senior psychology and criminology double major. <laughs> Thank you. Chemistry minor from Charlotte, North Carolina, and I currently serve as the 2023-2024 co-program director for the National Council of Negro Women. <laughs> On behalf of the National Council of Negro Women Howard Section, I would like to formally invite you to the 2024 NCNW Black History Month week entitled Her Legacy, Honoring Black Women in History. The purpose of this week is to shed light on black women in history in various different facets of society, whether it be professional, cultural, or through fellowship. Please join us as we collaborate with other organizations on campus this week as we celebrate the black women in the realms of poetry, STEM, black love, dance, and service. We look forward to seeing you there and have a blessed week. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicole Scott and I'm a criminology major from Charlotte, North Carolina. And my name is Shada Barnes. I'm a freshman nursing major from Jackson, Mississippi, and we are members of Ladies of the Quad Social Club. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite all my sisters to stand for recognition. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First, we would like to acknowledge the chapel and all of its respected leaders for this opportunity to speak during today's service. We would like to invite all of you to Chapter 38 Spring 2024 Week of Events for 
our week titled TQ Records. Um, be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms at LOQSC for updates and more information on each week or each day's event. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. I would like to thank all of the organizations that had a call today. Thank you. And now it's time for the quote of the week. It reads, success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed. And this is said by Booker T. Washington. I hope everyone has an amazing service. And remember, you can join chapel assistants every Friday at 5 p.m. in the little chapel of Carnegie Building. Thank you. We give God thanks for all of our organizations and ministries who had a call to chapel this morning. I um, want to particularly note the Howard Gospel Choir's call to chapel. And in, in our history lesson, which is needed. And don't they look grand? Beautiful, beautiful. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Saints has cried. 
mind. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God. Before any human hands touched us, you already knew us. In this moment, you're closer to us than our own thoughts. Our secrets are not a secret to you. And what we are struggling with and against, you already know. You know, oh God, that we have allowed little matters and the looks and the whims of others to determine how we feel about ourselves. You know that with all that you've provided, we have not allowed ourselves to, to really see, to, to feel, and to have gratitude for all that is good in our lives. Forgive us, Lord. Please forgive us. In this moment, speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us to, to know. Help us to, to feel our goodness. Cause us to believe in ourselves, to to love ourselves and to be patient with ourselves. In the midst of our, our falling short and, and despite our failures, make us to feel good about who we are and who we are becoming. As you mold us, as you, as you shape us, Give to us, O oh God, your, your blessed assurance that your love is enough, that the power that you've given us is enough, the, the mind that you have placed within us is enough. That the validation that we think we need from others can be found within ourselves and in you. Lord, help us to stop seeking from others what they are unwilling or unable to give to us. But let us, let us come to know, O oh God, to know a love that even if no one ever calls our names, holds our hands, or affirms our dreams, the love you give to us will be enough. Enough to sustain us, to keep us. A love that will hold us against all the pressures of this life. For those of us, Lord, who are, who are facing difficult challenges, Bring to our remembrance. Bring to our remembrance the times that we thought our disappointments, our failures would be the last word, but you turn them, oh God, into blessings. In you, oh Lord, we can hope against all hope. Your power to heal is beyond anything that we will ever fully understand. And so in this very moment, we, we open up our hearts to receive your healing. Come now, Lord.
with your healing power. Touch our minds, touch our hearts, touch our souls. And we ask for healing, Lord, not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones who need more than we could ever provide. We seek healing for your people everywhere. Lord, we, we seek healing for our nation and the nations of your world. Amid wars and rumors of more wars, amid spiritual wickedness in high and low places where, where people are using the name of Jesus to justify genocide, racism, greed, and the condemnation of people because of whom they love. Forgive us and heal us, Lord. We're not going to try to tell you how to do these things this morning. We're going to let go. And we're going to trust you. We're just going to trust you. Now drop thy still do for quietly. Until all our strivings cease. Take, Lord, from our souls the strain and the stress. And let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray.
some of the alum, Kristen Taylor and Clifton Walsh, who you see on television, coming back. <laughs> my, my. I'd like to um, acknowledge the presence of the dean of the chapel from Riley College, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Cecil Duffy. What an honor, serving many years in this chapel, and uh, to see you elevated, uh, what a blessing. <laughs> we also have with us the uh, Dean of the School of Social Work, Dean Sandra Cruz. I'm going to ask that you please stand. And she fusses at me every time I acknowledge her. That's OK. We also have Dr. Glenn Everett, Associate Dean in the College of Fine Arts, Chad Bozeman, there she is, and a member of Alfred Street Baptist Church. And, uh, what a blessing. I'm going to just ask the friends of the chapel if they would stand once again and so that I can thank you publicly for the tremendous work that you're doing here in the chapel, members of the Friends of the Chapel. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to, if the pastor wouldn't mind, to acknowledge the members of Alpha Street Baptist Church, I didn't even know you're playing hooky, that's okay. <laughs> Members of Alpha Street Baptist Church, would you please stand? My, my. <laughs> the pastor was in the back in the green room with his kappa hat on. And <laughs> very casual and talking, sharing with students, and I had to stop him. <laughs> and I told them, um, don't let him fool you. <laughs> he was there mingling with the students. But I had to share with them that they were in the presence of greatness. that I had to share with them what he is doing in ministry, not just in this area, but across the nation. Amen. His church, and his, that's right, you can clap. I 
I shared with Dr. Howard John Wesley, had the privilege of so many years of seeing the giants in this pulpit. And I remember as they were leaving, crossing over, and thinking about who would follow, and to see and have the opportunity to experience this new generation of leaders and what they are doing, uh, they're taking us even higher. And uh, Dr. Howard John Wesley is doing tremendous, just unbelievable work. Um, I can say so much. I will have to share that many, many years ago when he was in Springfield, um, I was invited to lead a retreat at Hartford Seminary. And Judy, Dr. Judy Frances Williams wanted me to meet this young man with tremendous potential. And so we went to dinner. And um, I affirmed what she thought and said, but he has surpassed even that. And um, I give God thanks for what he is doing, um, what he's done, and what he continues to do. Um, he came into this area after tremendous work in Springfield. He came to this area and to Alpha Chi, and the congregation has grown from 2,500 members to 10,000 members. And since 2020, Alpha Chi Baptist Church, under his guidance and, direc and direction, has donated more than $5.4 million to over 200 organizations. <laughs> With all that he has done, and um, he's also, and this is amazing in itself, he's also one of our nation's leading preachers. Not just a pastor, I mean, that in itself, but he's also one of the leading pastors in our nation. He's one of our greatest preachers. Can we say amen? amen. I give God thanks for his leadership, uh, what he has meant to so many. And uh, he's given me the opportunity to share uh, with him and at his church, and it's incredible, the work that he's doing. I want to thank you publicly, Pastor. And um, his mother is present with us this morning, and she is truly responsible. Can you raise your hand? Where is she? Oh. <laughs> Hard to see from here. Thank you so much. Uh, following the selection from the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University, uh, William Jones, student conductor, after we hear this marvelous selection, we will be blessed to experience the preaching, teaching and the ministry of Dr. Howard John Wesley. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord.
God who knows all about us. How grateful we are that even when our brokenness is self-inflicted, you have a balm to heal us. Thank you, O oh God, that your love knows no limitations, that your mercy is brand new every morning, and that your grace is sufficient. Now, God, I pray that you would speak in this place, that some broken heart might be healed, and that when we dismiss after the benediction, we will not only be those who've heard the word, but those who seek to live it. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen. To Dean Richardson, my friend, mentor in ministry, to the chaplains of Rankin Chapel, to the assistants, to the friends, to this gospel choir that carries on the rich legacy of singing the praises of Zion. I heard them say that they were looking for a piano. Well, Alpha Street's going to give you one uh, to support the ongoing work. It is the joy of our church to sow, to give, and I am I'm grateful, Dean, that I did not have to convene the deacons of the board to uh, make that gift. Um, I am blessed the Lord to pastor a phenomenal group of Christians who are committed to helping people experience and share the transformative love of Jesus. They have already been acknowledged, and I was taking attendance so that I knew <laughs> who was not in church this morning. Um, but I'm grateful for my family. <laughs> I'm grateful for the presence of my mother, who's here, who gave birth and taught me about Jesus Christ. I'm thankful. To all you, my family and friends, in Christ and creation, grace and peace be unto you. From God who loves us as mother and father, and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. And I do solicit your prayers. I am overwhelmed with gratitude and humility to stand in this place where the giants of the gospel stand and proclaim God's holy word. God and I know that I'm not worthy, but I'm thankful that you decided to give me a chance. Um, and I will not be before you long, but in this season of the celebration of the history and the heritage of African Americans in this land, I want to reread in your hearing a passage of scripture that may be familiar to any of us who spend any amount of time in church and chapel. It emanates Dean Richardson from the Gospel of John, that fourth book of the New Testament. And in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John, there is a verse nestled somewhere in the 30s that may sound familiar to you. John chapter 8, verse number 31, whatever version of the Bible you have before you reads a some, little something like this. Jesus said, to the Jews who were following him. If you abide in me and keep my word, you are my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And they responded to Jesus by saying this, we are the descendants of Abraham. And we have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say you shall be made free? 
You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they said, we're the descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say you shall be made free? The truth shall set you free. If you are of my generation and check the same age box that I do, and 50 is in your rearview mirror, then you may be familiar with what was my father's TV favorite television game show. It was a game show called To Tell the Truth. If you're under 50, my apologies for having to give you the Cliff Notes synopsis. But on To Tell the Truth, a game show that aired in 1956 on CBS. And after winning a syndication, it was revived some six times, most recently in 2016, being hosted by Anthony Anderson. The game show went a little something like this. There would be three contestants who come out, all claiming to be the same person. Two of them were pretenders, and one was the real deal. The host of the show would read the unique biography of the real deal of them being a lawyer, a doctor, a scientist. And then four celebrity panelists were introduced. And a round of questioning began where the panelists would ask questions of the contestants to try to determine who the real one was. The rules are very simple. The two who were pretending had to lie. And the one who was real always had to tell the truth. After the round of questions were completed, voting took place and the panelists would vote on who they thought the real person was. The host would then get up and say, share these words that became iconic in game show history. Will the real such and such please stand up? And the contestants, if they were able to persuade the panelists that their lies were true, earned more money based on their proficiency to tell a lie. If they could persuade you that their lies were true, they would win more money. The show is very popular. There's an online version. There's a board game version. If you go to Las Vegas, there's even a slot machine named to tell the truth. In the United States, it has aired for 28 seasons with more than 4,000 episodes. It currently airs in more than 16 countries around the globe. When a recent producer of the show was asked about the universal popularity of the game show to tell the truth, wondering why so many people liked it, here's what she said. She said, it's simple because it's easy to convince folk that a lie is true. How easy it is to persuade people to accept a lie as the truth. The contestants won money for their ability to lie, but the panelists were there to expose the truth. And y'all, you know what? That's just what life is like. That there are those who profit off of their lies. And then there are those who are called to seek the truth. Came by to give you warning that there is a difference between being entertained by a lie and ignoring the danger of living in one. It is one thing to find a lie entertaining. However, it is very dangerous to accept that a lie is the truth. If I can't persuade you of that, maybe you need to hang out in John chapter 8 where Jesus, our Lord and Savior, has once again found himself in 
contentious conversation with the Pharisees. Come back to first century Jerusalem and let's gain some perspective on modernity as we examine antiquity. Jesus is engaged in a, yet another debate with the Pharisees. Since you've gone to Sunday school and you come to chapel, you know a little something about the Pharisees. The Pharisees, Joseph, are a religious sect of Judaism that, that came to fruition between 160 and 140 B.C. They rose in response to the threat of Syrian assimilation, which was watering down Jewish culture. And in order to protect, protect Jewish purity, the Pharisees came about. They wanted to make certain that the bloodline was pure. They did not like the mixing of the races. They did not like the browning of America. So they rose to protect the purity of their people. And these Pharisees latched on to a strict adherence of Scripture, particularly around three areas. They latched on to the ritual of circumcision, the rules that control dietary protocol, and the religious observance of the Sabbath. Don't you miss this? They held on to the rituals, the rules, and the religion. And because of that, these Pharisees have continual arguments with Jesus. They argue with Jesus because the Pharisees ascribed to a hierarchy of sin. They would tell you that some sins were greater than others. And therefore, Pharisees like to preach about some sins, but won't touch any others. The, the Southern Baptist Pharisees would gather together and have a meeting dedicated to sharing that women are not called to preach, but they would never say a thing about black and brown lives being killed in the streets in which their churches reside. Pharisees argued with Jesus because, you see, Pharisees are more consumed with bedrooms than social justice. And so the Pharisees would catch a woman and a man in the act of adultery, but only bring charges against the sister. Because Pharisees think they have the right to tell a woman what she can and cannot do with her body. And rather than providing safe medical options and leaving her accountable to Jesus alone, they pass judgment. Pharisees, they prefer to use the Bible as a microscope and not a mirror. They use scripture to examine your life, but very rarely will they use scripture to examine their own. Pharisees ascribe to the weaponization of scripture so that they might demonize anything they define as other. Pharisees, y'all, are very selective in what scriptures they use. They don't quote the whole Bible, just bits and pieces. Pharisees love the laws of Leviticus, but they are ignorant of the Sermon on the Mount. And as a result, they have a hypocritical application of Scripture because they will tell a single sister who gets pregnant, you can't sing in the choir. But they'll let the adultering deacon lead worship and offer the prayer on Sunday morning. They will pull a queer brother off of the praise team but cash the check of the molesting uncle who is on the board. They are dangerous. The 
Pharisees, they don't like Samaritans. And so they want to close the borders of Israel to undocumented Samaritans crossing over the Jordan River and coming to take their jobs. But they didn't say anything about undocumented workers they stole from Africa and shipped across the Atlantic Ocean to come and pick their cotton and build the wealth of their nation. Ah, Pharisees believe that they are the only chosen people of God. Pharisees will have you believe that God is American. They will try to tell you that the Constitution is the 67th book of the Bible. And they act like the angels sing the Star Spangled Banner. These Pharisees have issue with Jesus. They got an issue with Jesus because you know what, Jesus, he cared so much about people's well-being, he healed them on the wrong day. He was not willing to wait for legislation to be passed and for Congress to get itself together. He did not wait for the right funding and the right approvals. He just thought that if someone was sick, they ought to be healed. They, they didn't like Jesus. Jesus cared so much about people being hungry, he didn't make them wash their hands first. Because feeding your stomach is more important than getting you clean in my eyes. They had a problem with Jesus because Jesus offered humanity, dignity, and respect to groups the Pharisees said were unclean. And because they had issue with Jesus, the Bible says they are repeatedly looking for a reason to kill him. Rankin Chapel, please don't get it twisted. Don't be confused. Their issue with Jesus, their wanting to kill him, was not simply theological. Their desire to kill him had nothing to do with who ate what and who washed their hands. No, their issue with Jesus was much deeper. They were jealous. They saw the popularity of Jesus. They saw the multitudes that were attracted to his miracles. They heard what the crowd said in Matthew 7 when Jesus finished teaching and the crowd responded, Jesus, you don't preach like the Pharisees. You preach with power and authority. They were jealous of Jesus in John chapter 12 they say to themselves, we got to kill him because the whole world is going after him. And these Pharisees who would read the Ten Commandments every day and heard the commandment, thou shalt not kill. These same Pharisees were willing to engage in hypocrisy to kill Jesus because Jesus threatened their privilege with Rome. Jesus threatened their popularity with people. Beloved, I came by to tell you, never underestimate the hypocrisy privilege will engage in to protect itself. To protect itself, privilege will change voting districts and enact voter ID laws. To protect itself, privilege will lose an election, incite an insurrection, and then say they have unfettered immunity from prosecution. <laughs> to protect itself, privilege will dismantle diversity, equity, and inclusion, and launch an unprecedented attack against the first black president of Harvard University because privilege is threatened. and will always seek to protect itself. And that seems to come to a head in John chapter 8. These Pharisees are threatened by Jesus, 
and they want to kill him. And if you read John chapter 8, you will find it is a chapter of argument and debate back and forth all around the true identity of Jesus. Because you see, Jesus has self-identified as the Son of God. His pronouns are I am. And these Pharisees don't like him choosing his own pronouns. And because they don't like the pronouns he's chosen, watch what privilege will do. It demonizes Jesus in the eyes of the people, and they say, you are possessed by the devil because when privilege is threatened, it will demonize and malign your character in the public eye to try to discredit you. You don't believe me? Ask Colin Kaepernick. He'll tell you about being demonized. You don't believe me? Ask Professor Ebony Marshall Terman, who threatened the sexism in church and has been deemed, you don't believe me? Ask Dr. Gina Stewart, who was the first woman to preach at the National Baptist Convention, and all of a sudden, her sermon disappeared off of Facebook. You don't believe me? Ask Claudine Gay what they did at Harvard University. You don't believe me? Ask Fannie Willis down in Georgia of what they'll do when you attack their privilege. They will demonize you. In John chapter 8, it all comes to a head because Jesus is tired of these Pharisees not acknowledging that they are in sin. So he says to them, you shall learn the truth and when you know the truth, you will be set free. After he says this, all hell broke loose. They are furious. And notice, Georgia Booker, what they say in response to Jesus. We are the descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves. You missed it, I'll try it again. We are the descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves. Okay, one more time for the sanctified slow. We are the descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves. Okay, in case you dropped out of Sunday school, <laughs> Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob's progeny, his 12 tribes, come after him, after his youngest son, Joseph, at the time, is sold into slavery, Joseph rises to become vice pharaoh of Egypt, only for all of Jacob's family to come and live in Egypt, and the Bible says, in Exodus chapter 1, that there arose a pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and he enslaved all of Abraham's descendants. Y'all, the entire book of Exodus is about God hearing the cry of the descendants of Abraham who are enslaved in Egypt and how God brings them out. But we are the descendants of Abraham and we've never been slaves. They are able to look all the way back at Abraham but miss slavery. 
They claim the moments of their history that make them proud. But now they want to erase and eradicate the ones that leave them feeling guilty and responsible. They can highlight Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but they want to deny the reality of the slavery that defined them as a people. And what a shame! Jesus is now dealing with the people who are living in defiant denial of the realities of their past. They are dedicated to distancing themselves from the very event that defined them as a nation. They have become a generation, in the words of Jack Nicholas, you can't handle the truth. They are sharing a lie. And just like in the game, they're winning off of it. They are profiting off of a lie. Y'all, they're winning. 29 states have pending legislation, and nine have already passed legislation to remove any reference of race from public school curricula. They are winning. Folk who could not ban guns that kill children in school are now banning Maya Angelou and Alice Walker. They are winning. Did you know that only 8% of graduating high school seniors in 2022 could identify slavery as the cause of the Civil War? They must have been taught by Nikki Haley. Did you know that 47% of voting Americans don't believe that systemic racism exists? And six of them sit on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. They are winning. The same folk that want to argue that they have the right to fly the Confederate flag because of their freedom of speech now want to ban any talk about the reality of race and slavery in the United States of America. They are winning. They redefined it as involuntary relocation. They're saying that slavery wasn't that bad because there were some good masters. They try to share that, that it was good for us because slavery introduced the heathen African to white man Christianity. They are trying to tell you that slavery somehow benefited black folk. We have never been a slave to anybody. How could they reach a place where they deny the very thing to find them as a people. Well, well, I struggle with this. Gail O'Day, who's a professor of New Testament and specialized in the Gospel of John, she argues that what they're really saying is that they, in their current situation, had never experienced slavery. You, you hear it. I never enslaved anybody. I'm, I'm not racist. I never called anybody a... That, that's not my generation. And the argument is that because I have no historical experience, I have no personal responsibility. That because I never enslaved anybody, I have no responsibility for slavery. And the Jews who are arguing with Jesus are making the same argument then that you hear now. Jesus, why you keep bringing up old stuff? 
Why you keep talking about stuff that's not politically correct anymore? Why you keep bringing up stuff that ain't got nothing to do with us? We have never been part of slavery. That is the argument of your Senate minority leader who suggests that we should never talk about reparations because slavery is 150 years in our past as if somehow the legacy of slavery has a statute of limitations. Why you keep bringing up old stuff? Why you keep talking about what happened with our forefathers? That's not us. Family, when I moved here to D.C. back in 2008, I had to go get a new physician. And Dean Richardson, I remember the first time going to meet my new physician, I went in to have my annual physical exam. She didn't know me, I didn't know her, but I wanted to make certain I was in good health. Come and test me to see if I'm okay. I go in and I meet her, and to my surprise and disgust, she spent the first 30 minutes of my exam asking me about my dad. Dr. Booker, she wanted to know, what does your dad die from? How many of your uncles have had prostate cancer? Does high blood pressure run in your family? I ain't come here to talk about my mama and my daddy. Why you keep bringing up <laughs> old stuff? To what she said to me, because the very thing that lived in your grandfather, it might be living in you. And if we don't diagnose your old stuff, we can never deal with your current stuff, that there's some stuff in your past that still lives in you. I came by to suggest that you cannot properly diagnose today without telling the truth of what happened yesterday. You will never understand how I felt about Ahmaud Arbery if you don't tell the truth of Emmett Till. You will never understand Black Lives Matter if you don't tell the truth about the red summer of 1919 when thousands of blacks were hung and lynched in the presence of police officers. You can't understand my issue with Clarence Thomas if you don't tell the truth about Jim Crow, separate but equal, and Thurgood Marshall. You will never understand why I support affirmative action until you tell the truth of what they did to Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you will not understand. Why I get so angry about voters' rights until you know they shot Medgar Evers dead in his driveway for trying to register us to vote. But we have never been slaves. Beloved, the legacy of supremacy, the legacy of racism is supremacy. And hear me, you cannot benefit from the legacy of slavery and not own the horrors of it. Let me say that again. You cannot be the inheritors of the rich legacy it has bequeathed you and at the same time want to deny the price that it cost somebody else. Kamara Jones is a medical doctor at Emory University, and she tells a story. The one night, she and her friends, after watching a Broadway show, go to dinner at a cafe. They're there around 11.30, 
At 12 o'clock, they notice that the owner comes and turns the sign around in the restaurant. She said they looked up at about 12 o'clock, 12.15, and they saw people hungry standing outside. And she could not wonder why they didn't just come in to eat until she recognized that the same sign that says open to her said close to someone else. And the privilege that she was taking for granted cost the closure to someone else. You cannot inherit privilege and not be aware of who it leaves out. We've never been a slave to anyone. I figured it out. You know what they were saying to Jesus? Slavery is over. That was Egypt. You hear it today. Slavery was bad, but the Civil War ended it. Martin Luther King Jr. brought an end to racism. Y'all elected a black president. What, what? Surely the playing field is equal. Color is not a consideration. Justice is blind. The Protestant work ethic applies to everybody. Racism is over. And the problem Jesus has with these Jews is the same problem today. He wants them to know, listen, you were slaves in Egypt but now you're under the oppression of Rome. Slavery didn't die, it just took on a new name. The Jews were there, he says, it was slavery, now it's colonialism. It, 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 it was Pharaoh, now it's Caesar. It, it was Egypt, now it's Rome. And contrary to popular opinion, I want you to know that the Civil War did not end slavery and civil rights did not end racism. It just took on another name. It took on the name of the Compromise of 1877 and Jim Crow. It took on the name Bull Connor and George Wallace. It took on the name poll tax and literacy exams. It took on the name sharecropping and convict leasing. It took on the name urban planning and redlining. It took on the name mass incarceration and prison labor. It took on the name Proud Boys and QAnon. Slavery and racism did not die. It just took on a new name, and the danger of denying the reality of slavery is that you miss that it just has a new name. And therefore, we are not free. There are battles that still must be fought, legislation that must be protected and overturned, work of God that we must do. Because these Jews would not acknowledge the horror of what was in their past, they missed their opportunity to be part of what God was doing right in front of them. Because when you lie about your past, you miss the opportunity to change it. What a shame to be so set on erasing history that you miss a chance to make it. We Never been a slave to anybody. Uh, Dean Richardson, I have to apologize because I've messed up in this sermon. I, I, I thought when Jesus was having this conversation, it was just with the Pharisees. But verse 31 says that these folk who are denying it, watch it, verse 31, these are the Jews who believed in him. These ain't my enemies. These my people. Uh, 
let me walk lightly here. Every Pharisee don't look like a Pharisee. You, you don't have to be a card-carrying registered member of the Pharisees to have some Pharisee in you. It's one thing for the enemy to deny the truth. It's another when it's our own people. How can my own people deny the reality of what we've come through? Maybe that's what Brother James Weldon Johnson meant when he put pen to paper and wrote these lyrics. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met the end, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget. What a shame to be so intoxicated with a little privilege and a little benefit and a little promotion that you now forget where God brought us from. I may not be invited back Rankin Chapel, but would you lean over to somebody and tell them stop drinking? I want you to sober up. Don't let that office in the C-suite intoxicate you. Don't let qualifying for a mortgage in that urban area make you intoxicated. Don't let the fact that you upgraded from a Buick to a BMW make you get it twisted. The Lord has brought us a mighty long way. I've got to leave you. Thank you for your time. May the Lord bless you mighty good. Jesus tells them, tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, you can never be free. Tell the truth. As dark and as ugly as it may be, it is the only thing that sets you. Tell the truth. Because when you tell the truth, you prevent a generation taking you backwards from where the Lord has already brought you. Y'all, uh, two summers ago, I was making my way back to D.C. from North Carolina with my son. We'd driven down there for a basketball tournament, and we were on our way back to D.C. from North Carolina. I'm on 95 headed north, and the traffic backs up, so I get on the side road 301. Making my way down 301, my son is asleep. I stop to get gas, I wake him up and says, your turn. Your turn to drive, I'm tired, I'm going to sleep. I said, get back on 301 and we'll get home. I woke up about 20 minutes later, we are halfway back to North Carolina. I said, what in the, son, you're going in the wrong direction. Then I realized I can't blame him, I gotta blame me. Because I let him sleep on the way we were headed and when it was his turn to drive, he did not know where we had come from and so he took us back to where we have been. And what a shame that we are going backwards. The lowest voter registration turnout in history going backwards. Using the same Bible that enslaved us to oppress women and queer, we're going backwards. Tell the truth. It's the only way you won't go backwards. Tell the truth so that the generation you raise can appreciate the value of what's in their hands. 
And maybe, just maybe, the reason we don't value where we are is because we have forgotten what it cost. My mother's here. And for the most of her life, when she was married to my father before he died, my mother longed for a full-length mink coat. She waited years for a full-length mink coat. And on the occasion of her 20th anniversary with my father, my dad bought my mom what she'd been waiting on, a full-length mink coat. Mama, you loved that mink coat. It's in my closet today. Mama loved that mink coat. And if the weather dropped below 50 degrees, That mean coat was coming out. Mama loved so much she laid it out on Saturday night because the saints on Sunday had to see the mean coat. I remember the first time I saw that mean coat, I went and I started rubbing on it, and it felt so good. Ooh, I like the way it felt. So I decided I want a little bit of it for myself. And so I grabbed some of the mink and I pulled on it. When I regained consciousness, I said, Mama, why would you do that to me? She said, boy, if you knew how much this coat cost, you wouldn't treat it like that. If you knew how much your daddy had to work and pay for it, you wouldn't treat it like that. If you knew how much sacrifice he had to make to put it in your hands, you would not disrespect it like that. You don't know what it cost. So yes, you got to go vote because it costs too much. And yes, you got to go to college, because it costs too much. And yes, you got to start your own business, because it costs too much. Yes, you got to run for office, because it costs too much. Somebody holler, tell the truth. It's the only way we don't go backwards. It's the only way we're responsible for what we've been given. But it is in the telling of the truth that hope is born. It is in the telling of truth that a hope is born that does not die easily. A hope that sees the dawning of darkness and still believes better is on the way. A hope that does not give up simply because in spite of all the accusations and impeachments and verdicts and despite the projection that he's on his way back, there's something inside that will not quit. Beloved, because it is in the dark past of yesterday that we encounter a faith that fertilizes our hope. In the dark past of yesterday is the uterus of faith that protects the embryo of hope. This is why James Weldon Johnson said, sing a song full of the faith that the, I wish there was some folk in here, dark past has taught us, sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Because in that dark past, we encounter our faith. In that dark past, we see the hand of God. In that dark past, God reveals himself. In that dark past, faith gives birth to hope. Goodbye, Rankin Chapel. May the Lord bless you. Mighty good. Jesus told them, 
tell the truth. And that's exactly what Moses told the children of Israel as they got ready to walk in the promised land. He said, when you make it to the promised land and you get to that place where God has done what God said God would do, when you reach that place that you pull up to church in your Mercedes and your Lexus, when you can stay in hotels so nice, the towels won't fit in your suitcase. <laughs> when you've landed in that place, Moses says, sit down and tell your children and your children's children that we were once slaves in Egypt, but we called on the name of God. And when God heard our cries, we serve a God that brought us out of the darkness to where we stand today. Tell your children, we were slaves, but God. Tell your children about the four little girls, but God. Remind them of Emmett Till, but God. Tell them about the 16th Street Baptist Church. But God, but God, but God. God of our weary years. God of our silent tears. Thou who has brought us thus far on our way. Thou who is by thy might led us into the light keep us forever in the path we pray lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee and lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. Tell the truth. And now, to the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Eternal, the Sovereign, the Faithful and Omnipotent God, who alone is Creator of heaven and earth, to the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who always and alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return said amen.